Hey there, greetings. This is gonna be a bit of an early week slash midweek session. Might get less views, but whatever. I had an interesting topic and we're gonna go for it. Uh, before we dig in, let's take a quick look at a couple new observations and a couple new things. So I've added some more info to the readme here. Uh, there've been some good contributions from the community related to uh, Mac and Linux use, uh, but mainly I wanted to talk about uh, this aspect right here on the on the latency and the performance. I did some experimentation and testing and I actually added in some logging to see how much each of the steps was taking between sort of me pressing the space bar and the playback beginning. It turns out that the faster whisper uh, transcription takes in the range of four seconds and change. So that I think is actually probably the biggest opportunity. Uh, it seems like once my audio is transcribed, uh, it takes about three and a half seconds for the Anthropic API to start streaming tokens back. So I don't know that there's too much we could modify there. Uh, maybe a local model, but I really, you know, I prefer Claude over any of the local models currently, but I could certainly see a design where, you know, if your objective wasn't to have that sort of deep philosophical conversation and all of that sort of stuff. Um, definitely a, a local faster model could work. It seems like once the tokens start streaming back to the time that it has sort of a, uh, a good chunk to send off to 11 labs, that's about 1.25 seconds. And then 11 labs generating the audio is actually uh, probably shorter than I would have expected. 1.25 seconds and then Pygame playing it back is, uh, is, is pretty light as well, uh, very quick. So what I'm thinking about, I haven't done it for this version, but I did find this person's library that seems really cool, really impressive for sort of a, it's another variation, as I understand it, of the Whisper open source model, uh, as is Faster Whisper. That was, uh, Whisper is originally a model open sourced by OpenAI, but his seems to, to kind of in very good real time kind of transcribe it. I'm not sure if... Uh, yeah, I don't think on this particular view in my capture software, it has, it's playing the computer audio, but it, it, I would say is much less of a delay. So I think there could be a variation where uh, I will look to fold in this real time SST by Cold Jabi and, uh, and see about, you know, potentially swapping out, you know, what could save on the, on the, the order of uh, a third, more than a third, you know, maybe, uh, yeah, somewhere around a third of the, the time there. So that could be fun. That could be interesting. Uh, I have swapped in a new Claude voice. We're not loading any conversations from scratch, uh, or we are starting from scratch, not loading any conversations. So let's go ahead and dig in. Hey there, good evening. Do you have any questions about the instructions in your system message? We're gonna cover quite a bit of ground. Uh, also know that I have my program appending a reminder to be brief. Uh, know that that is not me scolding you. questions. I'm ready to dive in. Let's keep things snappy and see where the conversation takes us. What would you like to chat about first? Okay, so in previous conversations with other instances of Claude, we went down a number of different routes uh, related to a, a handful of different philosophers. And that got me thinking back to uh, a sort of philosophy or, or some sort of class that I took where the professor was making a point that I found pretty interesting. He was saying that the viewpoints of these philosophers are informed largely by their time and they are often in reaction to their time. So someone like Thomas Hobbes saying, hey, we need a, you know, we need a Leviathan, we need a, a force to be reckoned with that has sort of sole authority. It was in response to just mayhem in the streets of England. And, and you know, he, he, I think, made the point that all good men had left. So I'll start there. I'll, I'll see if that's a, a concept you're familiar with or if it resonates with you. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of build off that concept. Absolutely. The idea that philosophers are products of their time and respond to the unique challenges they face is spot on. Hobbes's call for a strong central authority in Leviathan 
was undoubtedly shaped by the chaos he witnessed in 17th century England. It's fascinating to consider how different historical contexts mold philosophical perspectives. Do you think there are any modern day examples of this phenomenon at play? Well, that is where I am intending to take this conversation. But how about actually, would you would you just refresh my memory? It's been a decade and a half. Would you refresh my memory on on Hobbes and on what his sort of main points were? I, I kind of only have that top level brush. Uh, but yeah, would you bring me back up to speed on what I probably uh, at one point knew? Sure thing. Hobbes' key work was Leviathan, published in 1651. His main argument was that the natural state of mankind is a war of all against all, and that life without government is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. To escape this miserable existence, Hobbes believed people should surrender their rights to a strong, centralized authority, the Leviathan, to maintain order and security. He favored an absolute monarchy, seeing it as the best way to avoid civil war. Essentially, Hobbes prioritized stability and security over individual liberty. His views were heavily influenced by the English civil war that raged while he was writing. Does that help jog your memory? Yeah, it does, thanks. And I'm, I'm sort of recalling that he was one of the social contractarians was another aspect that his, uh, his name seems to ring a bell with me for. And were the other ones, uh, I think Rousseau and Locke, uh, and, and they were basically the first ones saying, this is, well, I'll let, you, I'll let you summarize it for me. You're right, Hobbes was one of the key social contract theorists alongside Locke and Rousseau. They all addressed how societies should be governed, but had different takes. Hobbes argued for surrendering individual rights to a monarch for the sake of order. Locke believed in natural rights, life, liberty, property, and that government should protect these rights. If it fails to do so, the people have the right to overthrow it. Rousseau emphasized the general will of the people as the basis for political authority. He believed in direct democracy and popular sovereignty. So while they all use the concept of a social contract, their visions range from Hobbes's absolute monarchy to Locke's constitutional government to Rousseau's radical democracy. Quite the spectrum. Yeah, quite the spectrum indeed. So circling back around to that concept that these philosophers are all sort of uh, generating their ideas in response to their circumstance, uh, would you say that also applies to Locke and Rousseau? I, I, it much more resonated with me and I recall it much more related to Hobbes, but would you say that Locke and Rousseau uh, were also sort of products of uh, a reaction to their surrounding time period. Absolutely. Locke and Rousseau were also very much shaped by the times they lived in. Locke wrote in the Kikob, in the late 17th century, right after the glorious revolution that established constitutional monarchy in England. His ideas about natural rights and limited government reflected the desire to avoid the abuses of absolute rule. Rousseau, writing in the, in the mid 18th century, was influenced by the Enlightenment and the growing social inequality in France leading up to the revolution. His calls for popular sovereignty and equality were a response to the Ancien Regime. So while their specific circumstances differed, all three were definitely reacting to the political and social dynamics of their eras. It's like they say, philosophy doesn't arise in a vacuum. A little bit of a, I'm, I'm not talking to Claude yet, but there's a little bit of an interesting kind of hitch in that audio playback that I haven't heard in these previous sessions. So I'm interested to keep going and see what happens with that and if it becomes worse or better. Okay, cool. So bringing that into let's look at uh, the last decade or two, sort of the 21st century. What would you say are the defining characteristics of our current circumstance and our current surroundings? And would you say there are already uh, novel philosophies that are sort of arising in reaction to that?
Great question. The 21st century has been marked by rapid technological change, globalization, increasing inequality, polarization, and the looming threat of climate change. We've seen the rise of social media, AI and automation, as well as growing political divisions and populist movements. In response, we're seeing new philosophical currents emerge. There's a growing interest in effective altruism and long-termism, which argue we should prioritize reducing existential risks and shaping the long-term future. The advent of AI has also spurred a lot of work in the philosophy of technology and the ethics of AI. Thinkers like Thomas Piketty and Kate Raworth are grappling with questions of inequality and proposing new economic paradigms. And on the political front, we're seeing interesting debates play out between liberalism, communitarianism, and post-liberalism. So while it may take some historical distance to gain perspective, I'd argue we're already seeing novel philosophical ideas arise in response to the unique challenges of our time. The 21st century is shaping a new generation of thinkers. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, I am not all that familiar with those individuals and those terms. Would you give us a quick intro to Thomas Piketty, Kate Raworth, uh, as well as I'm vaguely familiar with liberalism, and it's not liberalism uh, as in the liberal party, but uh, refresh us on that as well, and perhaps communitarianism and post-liberalism. Absolutely. Here's a quick rundown. Thomas Piketty is a French economist known for his work on wealth and income inequality. His book, Capital in the 21st Century, argued that returns on capital tend to outpace economic growth, leading to rising inequality. Kate Raworth is an economist who developed the idea of donut economics, an economic model that balances social and ecological concerns. The goal is to meet human needs while staying within planetary boundaries. Liberalism, in the philosophical sense, prioritizes individual rights, free markets, and limited government. Think thinkers like John Locke and John Stuart Mill. Communitarianism emerged in the 1980s as a critique of liberalism. It emphasizes the importance of community, shared values, and the common good over individual autonomy. Post-liberalism is a more recent current that argues liberalism is in crisis and advocates moving beyond it. Post-liberals often criticize individualism, capitalism, and the liberal international order they tend to favor more communitarian and nationalist approaches. There's obviously a lot more to unpack with each of these, but hopefully that gives you a high level overview. Let me know if you want to dig deeper on any of them. Okay, and so where I ultimately had in mind taking this conversation is I'd like to, to spend a bit of time with you thinking about what will come in the next couple decades. And so let's start by doing that, and then we'll, we'll later come back around and look at it through the lens of what do you think the philosophically novel ideas will be in reaction to that you know, next, next two decades or so. So let's start with just the logistics. I know there's AI. I heard David Shapiro giving a great talk on on biotech and fusion uh, and a, a number of other topics where he was uh, sort of anticipating the next 20 years in, in and I think he was taking it from a sort of positive standpoint. So help me sort of talk through and think through what will be the two to three decades to come as far as progress and change. It seems like it will be significant. The next two to three decades are likely to bring transformative changes across multiple domains. I expect we'll see. One, artificial intelligence becoming increasingly sophisticated and ubiquitous, reshaping the economy, labor market, and decision-making in industries from healthcare to finance to transportation. Two, rapid progress in biotechnology, leading to personalized medicine, gene editing, and potentially even life extension. We may also see new approaches to food production and environmental remediation. Three, a global energy transition as renewables like solar and wind scale up and new technologies like fusion potentially come online with major geopolitical implications. Four, 
Continued digitization and automation of work, requiring significant reskilling and raising challenging questions about the future of jobs and income distribution. Five, growing impact of climate change, necessitating major adaptations in areas like agriculture, infrastructure, and urban planning, as well as difficult trade-offs and questions of global equity. Of course, the pace and path of change is uncertain, and there will likely be disruptions and surprises along the way. But overall, the next few decades promise to be a period of rapid technology-driven transformation that will require novel approaches to governance, economics, and social organization. So those are good sort of high level summaries. Let's drill into those a little bit more. What would you envision? Could you provide an example or two of, uh, of what each of those technologies and, and sort of concepts that you mentioned will result in, in, in sort of a, a modern understanding and, and you know, what we can expect to see and how you think it will uh, impact the landscape and the world and all of these aspects of economics and governance and all of that. Sure, let's dive a bit deeper into a couple of these areas. In AI, we might see the emergence of artificial general intelligence, AGI, that can match or exceed human capabilities across a wide range of domains. This could lead to breakthroughs in scientific discovery, like AI systems autonomously conducting research and making novel insights. But it could also displace many knowledge workers and raise thorny questions about the control and alignment of such powerful systems. In biotech, cheap genome sequencing and advanced gene editing tools like CRISPR could enable personalized therapies and enhancements. We might be able to cure genetic diseases, slow aging, or even augment human capabilities. But this also raises ethical dilemmas around equity, consent, and what it means to be human. On energy, cheap, abundant, clean energy could transform geopolitics, reducing the importance of oil-rich regions and empowering nations with lots of solar and wind resources. Fusion in particular could be a game changer, providing a virtually limitless, always on source of clean energy. This could also enable energy intensive activities like desalination and carbon removal. The common thread here is that these technologies have immense potential benefits, but also pose complex challenges in areas like ethics, governance, security, and social stability. We'll likely need new institutions and approaches to manage them responsibly. Does this help paint a more concrete picture? Let me know if you want to explore any of these scenarios further. Yeah, you mentioned biotech, and, and we've been talking about biotech as a way to slow aging and augment human capabilities. It, it seems to me like we are not that far of a leap away from perhaps uh, with a neural link type implant and with the ability for uh, a, a very advanced technology to be embedded in and viewing all of the movements within a human brain, it, it seems like it wouldn't be, I mean, it's a big leap, but not a insurmountable uh, leap to understand or, or potentially imagine uh, to such an advanced technology being able to map the, uh, the layout and landscape of a human brain. Is that the sort of thing that you could envision coming from biotech or is that you know perhaps more on a medium long term or not even really that feasible you raise an intriguing point about the potential for neural interfaces and brain mapping I think this is definitely an area where we could see significant progress in the coming decades. We're already seeing early steps in this direction with initiatives like Neuralink, which is developing brain machine interfaces that could eventually allow direct communication between brains and computers. And there are a number of large scale brain mapping projects underway, like the Human Connectomy Project and the Brain Initiative, which aim to create detailed maps of neural connections and activity. As these technologies advance, it's conceivable that we could develop the ability to read and write information to the brain with high precision. This could enable things like downloading skills and memories, enhancing cognitive capabilities, or even creating backups of our minds. 
However, the brain is enormously complex and we still have a lot to learn about how it encodes information and gives rise to consciousness. Mapping its structure in detail is one thing, but truly understanding its function is a bigger challenge. We'll also need to grapple with the profound ethical implications of these capabilities. So while I believe advanced neural interfaces are a real possibility in the coming decades, I suspect it will be a gradual process with many technical and ethical hurdles along the way. We're more likely to see narrow applications at first, with the more radical possibilities coming later. Okay, so I see that Anthropic had an error here. This is a good opportunity to test the real purpose of uh, me being able to load in a, uh, an in-flight conversation. So let's go ahead and do this live. Should be this last transcript. I want to copy the relative path. Let's say... Hello there again. It looks like we were cut off by a program error. Are you able to see the conversation that we've had up to this point? Yes, I can see our entire conversation up to the point where you asked about the potential for advanced brain mapping technology. It seems my response was cut off. To briefly summarize, I think mapping the full layout and landscape of the human brain is probably more of a longer-term possibility given the immense complexity involved. In the nearer term, I'd expect more targeted biotech enhancements and therapies. But I agree that truly understanding the brain's intricacies is not insurmountable given the exponential pace of progress. Where would you like to take the discussion from here? Well, yeah, I think that exponential pace of progress is really what's striking to me. If we, you know, on the scale of five to ten years, can create artificial general intelligence that can make itself stronger and can help solve fusion and can help make biotech breakthroughs. It does seem as though that, you know, maybe they would call it a fast takeoff if I've heard the term. Uh, that would be the sort of thing where the AGI becomes very good very quickly and it helps us do all of these other things very quickly. So maybe the, you know, the decades, centuries time frame that, you know, we would imagine on the scale of human innovation could be truncated to years or months or hours. Absolutely. The potential for AGI to accelerate progress is mind boggling. If we do achieve AGI that can recursively improve itself, it could lead to an intelligence explosion where centuries of progress happen in mere years, months, or even faster. The implications are both exhilarating and sobering. On one hand, AGI could help us crack fusion, cure diseases, and solve many of humanity's greatest challenges with astonishing speed. But it also raises profound risks and ethical quandaries that we'll need to grapple with. The prospect of such a fast takeoff scenario really underscores the importance of getting the alignment and control problems right with AGI. We'll want to ensure it remains beneficial and aligned with human values, even as it races forward. No easy task. What do you think will be some of the key philosophical and societal questions we'll face in the charts eat us slave rump and tomorrow in the coming years as these technologies barrel towards us? I'm curious to hear your take. That was another interesting little blip. I'm not sure if it's that perhaps there is an element of an additional language in this model. Um, this particular voice model that we're using, I think it's called Ryan from Eleven Labs. I'm, this is me now speaking to the recording, not, not speaking to Claude yet. Yeah, I wonder, so I, this, this voice I think has a hint of South African, so I wonder if that's you know maybe like an Afrikaans or if it's just the a blip in the transcription being sort of chunked and fed over. Uh, not sure about that. That's an interesting one. Maybe I'll come back around and see what what's actually hitting the transcript and what's actually hitting the Eleven Labs API. So now back to Claude. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's interesting sti striking potential there, and I think another element that could be intriguing and that perhaps. Uh, 
you may be understating and, and many may be understating is the degree of disruption in sort of the economy that we've you know largely known for recent memory. Uh, this, this sort of concept of people work to fulfill a job and they are paid to fulfill that job and that's how they spend their time. That seems to have been how it's, how it's largely gone for uh, the recent past. What do you envision first as the landscape of such an, an AI oriented economy? Uh, what are the implications? And, and uh, then I'll ask a, a follow up question after that. You raise a fascinating point about the potential for AI to fundamentally disrupt our economic paradigm. I think you're right that I may have understated the magnitude of the shift we could see. In an AI-oriented economy, we might see a rapid displacement of many jobs across sectors as AI and automation become more capable. This could lead to wide-scale technological unemployment, necessitating a rethinking of how we distribute resources and provide a social safety net. We may need to decouple income from work and consider ideas like universal basic income, the nature of jobs, and how people spend their time could radically change. Some argue this could free people to pursue more creative, fulfilling endeavors, but it could also exacerbate inequality if the gains of AI primarily accrue to a small group. The transition could be quite destabilizing and painful in the short term. Even if we end up in a better place in the long run, we'll need to proactively design policies to help manage the disruption. I'm curious, what do you think some of the key challenges and opportunities might be in an AI-driven economy? And how do you think we can best prepare for such a shift? Yeah, I think from a monetary perspective, that is, that is the, the biggest risk in, in my mind. I feel like it's easy to get, uh, I think Sam Altman called it the theatrical risks, uh, a lot of attention, you know, the Terminator type things. But I think the, the just large large scale uh, disruption of the world as we know it is going to, I think, test the boundaries and the limits of, uh, of our systems and, uh, and societies to, to sort of react to. The, the real question I was going to ask, though, that I wanted to get this thread down towards is what would be a way that humans can find a sense of purpose and meaning uh, in that landscape where, you know, there may be universal basic income, there may be uh, a, a large amount of free time. What does everyone do with themselves? That's a profound question and cuts to the heart of the human condition. In a world where work is no longer necessary for survival, how do we find meaning and purpose? I think it will require a significant cultural and philosophical shift. We'll need to move away from the idea that our worth is tied to our economic productivity. Instead, we may need to embrace a more intrinsic view of human value and meaning. People could find purpose through creativity, art, relationships, learning, exploration, and service to others. We might see a flourishing of human potential as people are free to pursue their passions without economic constraints, but it will also require building a strong sense of community and social connection. Without the structure and identity that work provides, people will need other ways to feel part of something larger than themselves. We may also need to redefine progress and success on a societal level. Rather than optimizing for economic growth, we may need to prioritize measures of well-being, fulfillment, and sustainability. Ultimately, I think the transition will be challenging, but it also presents an opportunity to reassess our values and build a world that better aligns with what matters most to us as humans. We'll need a new philosophical framework for the age of AI. What do you think are some of the key values and ideas that should guide us as we navigate this transition? How can we build a future that keeps human flourishing at the center? Yeah, interesting, interesting thoughts, interesting questions. How would you say, based on what seems to be a trend in the opposite direction uh, with all of you know the, the last couple decades of social media and almost a sense of digital isolation, how would you say that we ought to be thinking about building community and, and social connection?
You're right. The trend towards digital isolation and the atomizing effects of social media pose a real challenge. We'll need to be intentional about fostering genuine human connection and community in the age of AI. I think part of the solution is designing technology that brings people together in the real world, rather than just connecting us online. We could prioritize tools for local community building, civic engagement, and shared experiences. We may also need a cultural shift towards valuing in-person interaction and shared space, policies that encourage walkable neighborhoods, public gathering places, and community events could help. Education will also play a key role. We should teach skills for empathy, communication, and collaboration alongside technical skills. Emphasizing the humanities and social emotional learning could help foster a more connected populace. Ultimately, I think we need a renewed emphasis on the collective good and our shared humanity. Rebuilding a sense of solidarity and common purpose will be essential. This could involve everything from national service programs to a more robust social safety net that gives everyone a stake in society. It's a tall order, but I believe rebuilding community and connection will be one of the defining challenges and opportunities of the coming decades. We'll need to be creative and proactive in designing a future that brings us together rather than pushing us apart. What role do you think philosophy and ethics should play in shaping our approach to these issues? And how can we ensure the benefits of AI are widely shared and contribute to a thriving society for all? I think this is kind of where uh, I was initially envisioning this conversation going. I think we've we've been through a bunch of different topics around how the world will likely change, i.e. the the landscape from which the philosophers of the year 2050 will be reacting and responding with what we're sort of seeing about biotech extending human life, you know, this, this potential for uh, further stratification of the haves versus the haves not with people potentially having a huge amount of free time uh, as well as you know with a lot of these these kind of technolo uh, t technological advances like fusion you know making the compute and the, the capabilities potentially compound on themselves what do you envision the philosophers of that time will be saying in response to that landscape I think the philosophers of 2050 will be grappling with a host of profound questions raised by the transformative impact of AI and other emerging technologies. Some key themes I anticipate. One, redefining the human condition. As AI and biotech blur the lines between natural and artificial, philosophers will need to re-examine what it means to be human. They may explore concepts of identity, consciousness, and free will in a world where these boundaries are increasingly fuzzy. Two. The ethics of enhancement. With powerful tools to enhance our bodies and minds, philosophers will debate the moral implications. Is there an obligation to enhance? Could it exacerbate inequality? They'll need to balance the potential benefits with concerns about authenticity and fairness. Three, the purpose of life in a post-scarcity world. If AI eliminates the need for most human labor, philosophers will grapple with questions of meaning and fulfillment they may draw on ancient traditions while also articulating new visions of the good life untethered from economic necessity. Four, maintaining human agency and control. As AI systems become more autonomous and capable, philosophers will wrestle with how to ensure human agency and alignment with our values. They'll explore new models of governance and control to shape the development of transformative AI. Five, cosmopolitanism and global cooperation. The challenges of the future will require coordination on a global scale. Philosophers may make the case for expanding our circle of ethical concern and embracing a more cosmopolitan worldview to ensure the benefits of technology are widely shared. Of course, the specifics will depend on how the future unfolds. But I believe grappling with the human condition in an age of artificial intelligence will be the central project of philosophy in the coming decades. It will require both drawing on the wisdom of the past and imagining bold new paradigms for the future. What do you see as the most urgent philosophical questions we'll need to address? 
and how can we ensure the conversation includes diverse voices and perspectives? Yeah, these are really helpful. Thanks. I, I would like to drill in on that human condition one. You mentioned it as your very top topic, and then you came back around and, and re-mentioned it at the end. I will say also that as you're kind of giving these responses, I have uh, a next question often in mind, so you don't necessarily need to, to ask me kind of follow-up uh, generalist questions. You can if you have a pointed one or a good witty rhetorical question or something like that, but just throwing that out there. Uh, could you drill in a little bit more for me on what you think they will be exploring around uh, the concepts of what it means to be a human, uh, identity, consciousness, free will, all of those sorts of things that you kind of alluded to in your first point there about redefining the human condition. Absolutely. Let's dive deeper into how philosophers might redefine the human condition in light of AI and other advances. As AI becomes more sophisticated, it may challenge our notions of what makes us uniquely human. If machines can exhibit intelligence, creativity, and even emotions, what does that mean for human identity and exceptionalism? Philosophers may grapple with questions of machine consciousness and whether AIs can truly be considered alive or have moral status. This could lead to a re-examination of theories of mind and consciousness. The development of advanced neural interfaces and brain-computer links could also blur the boundaries between human and machine. If our minds are intimately connected with AI, it may become harder to distinguish where we end and the technology begins. This could raise questions about the nature of the self and personal identity. The increasing power of AI may also lead to questions about free will and agency. If AI can predict and influence our behavior, are we truly free and autonomous? Philosophers may need to reconcile traditional notions of libertarian free will with a world where our choices are shaped by algorithms. At the same time, the potential for AI to enhance human cognition could lead to new ways of thinking and experiencing the world. Philosophers may explore how these enhancements change the human condition and whether they represent a fundamental shift in what it means to be human. Ultimately, I believe these developments will challenge us to redefine personhood and what we value about humanity. Philosophers will need to grapple with how to maintain human dignity and meaning in a world where the line between human and machine is increasingly blurred. They may need to articulate new visions of flourishing that aren't predicated on outdated notions of human exceptionalism. But I also think there will be exciting opportunities to imagine new forms of collaboration and symbiosis between humans and machines. Philosophers could help us navigate this new landscape and find ways to enhance the human condition rather than diminish it. It will require both humility and imagination as we redefine what it means to be human in the age of AI. How do you think that redefinition changes the geopolitical landscape? Is there a role for the contemporary nation state in that landscape? Is it that we become a more global entity? Is it that we uh, look inward and become more local communities. Uh, how do you think that unfolds? I think the redefinition of the human condition in the age of AI will have profound implications for the geopolitical landscape. As the boundaries between human and machine blur, it may challenge traditional notions of national identity and sovereignty. On one hand, the global nature of AI development and the shared challenges we face could push us towards greater international cooperation and a more cosmopolitan worldview. The benefits and risks of AI are not confined by national borders, so we may need to develop new forms of global governance to manage these technologies responsibly. This could lead to a strengthening of international institutions and a move towards more global decision-making. Nation states may need to cede some sovereignty to global bodies in order to coordinate on issues like AI safety, wealth distribution, and enhancing the human condition. At the same time, the disruptive impact of AI could also lead to a backlash and a turn inward. As people grapple with the pace of change and the potential for widespread unemployment, there could be a resurgence of nationalism and protectionism. Nations may seek to assert control over AI development and hoard the benefits for their own citizens. We could see a fracturing of the global order 
and a retreat to local identities and communities. People may find solace in smaller scale affiliations as the nation state struggles to adapt to the challenges of AI. Ultimately, I think the path forward will require striking a balance between global cooperation and local autonomy. We'll need international coordination to ensure the safe and beneficial development of AI, but we'll also need to empower local communities to shape how these technologies are integrated into their lives. The nation state will likely still have a role to play, but it may need to be reimagined for the age of AI. Governments will need to be more agile, responsive, and innovative in order to keep pace with technological change. They'll need to prioritize policies that enhance human flourishing and ensure the benefits of AI are widely shared. But I also think we'll see the emergence of new forms of social and political organization that transcend national boundaries. From global governance structures to decentralized networks enabled by blockchain, we may need to experiment with novel ways of coordinating and making decisions at scale. Navigating this geopolitical landscape will require both pragmatism and vision. We'll need to be clear-eyed about the challenges we face, while also daring to imagine new forms of social and political organization that enhance human flourishing in the age of AI. It won't be easy, but I believe it's a challenge we must embrace if we want to create a better future for all. Here's a question that I'm just a bit interested in, in your take and your training and your intuition. So, you know, feel free to answer as, uh, as openly as you would like, you know, don't, don't hold anything back. I'm, I'm very intrigued to see how you respond to this. What nations would you envision being particularly positive contributors to this new landscape? First, which nations would you envision taking that more uh, cynical uh, sort of protectionist approach, both nations and, and potentially factions within nations? It's a great question and I'll share my perspective but of course, it's hard to predict exactly how different nations will respond to the challenges and opportunities of AI. That said, here are some thoughts. On the more positive side, I could see nations with strong traditions of democracy, human rights, and international cooperation taking a lead in shaping the development of AI for global benefit. Countries like Canada, Sweden, and New Zealand have shown a commitment to progressive values and could be standard bearers for responsible AI development. Among the major powers, the European Union may be well positioned to take a human-centric approach to AI governance, given its emphasis on privacy, ethics, and social protection. If the EU can speak with a united voice, it could be a counterweight to more authoritarian approaches to AI. In terms of cynical or protectionist responses, there's a risk that countries with a more nationalistic orientation, such as Russia or China, could seek to use AI as a tool for social control and geopolitical advantage. They may be less constrained by considerations of individual rights and more willing to sacrifice privacy and autonomy for the sake of national strength. Even in liberal democracies like the United States, there are factions that could push for a more inward-looking approach to AI. We've seen how the disruptive impact of globalization and technological change can fuel populist backlash. If the benefits of AI are seen as accruing primarily to elites, it could deepen divisions and lead to calls for restricting or nationalizing these technologies. There's also a risk of an AI arms race between great powers, with nations racing to develop advanced AI capabilities for military and strategic advantage. This could lead to a fragmentation of the global AI landscape and make international cooperation more difficult. Ultimately, I believe the path forward will require a combination of visionary leadership and grassroots activism. We'll need nations and leaders who can articulate a compelling vision of a human-centric approach to AI and who are willing to cooperate across borders to make it a reality. But we'll also need an engaged and informed global citizenry who demand that AI be developed in ways that benefit humanity as a whole. My hope is that the transformative potential of AI will inspire us to transcend our differences and work together towards a future of shared prosperity and enhanced human flourishing. But realizing that vision will require active effort and a commitment to our highest ideals. We'll need philosophers, policymakers, technologists, and engaged citizens all working together to shape the future we want to see. How do you think open source 
contributes positively or detracts from that? Do you think open sourcing the top current models would be a net positive uh, because people can explore them, they can run them through security checks, or do you think it would be a net negative in that potentially bad actors could get their hands on the current state of the art and develop it uh, in those same ways for different motives? Open source is a double-edged sword when it comes to AI development. On the positive side, open sourcing AI models could democratize access to these powerful tools and allow for greater scrutiny and collaboration. It could enable researchers around the world to audit these systems for safety and bias and to build on each other's work to accelerate progress. Open source could also help to level the playing field between nations and prevent an AI arms race. If the leading AI models are openly available, it reduces the incentive for nations to pursue secret AI development programs for geopolitical advantage. However, there are also significant risks to open sourcing advanced AI systems. As you point out, it could enable bad actors to access and misuse these technologies for harmful ends, such as surveillance, disinformation, or even weaponization. There's also a risk that open sourcing could exacerbate the concentration of power in the hands of a few large tech companies. If these companies are the primary ones with the resources to develop and maintain large open source AI models, it could entrench their dominance and limit the ability of other actors to compete. Ultimately, I believe the benefits of open sourcing likely outweigh the risks, but only if it's done thoughtfully and with appropriate safeguards in place. This could include measures like gradual release of models with increasing capabilities, rather than immediately open sourcing the most advanced systems, requiring users to agree to certain terms of use and ethical guidelines before accessing the models, investing in AI safety research and developing robust monitoring and response mechanisms to detect and mitigate misuse, encouraging the development of a diverse ecosystem of AI developers and stakeholders, rather than concentrating power in a few large companies. Open sourcing advanced AI is not a panacea but I believe it can be a powerful tool for building a more equitable, transparent, and beneficial AI future. The key will be to proactively address the risks and ensure that the development of these technologies is guided by a commitment to the collective good. Striking the right balance won't be easy, and there will undoubtedly be challenges and setbacks along the way. But if we approach the issue with wisdom, foresight, and a dedication to our highest values, I believe open source can be a net positive force in shaping the trajectory of AI for the betterment of humanity. Thank you. What is a panacea? Would you define that for me? A panacea is a solution or remedy that is claimed to solve all problems or cure all illnesses. It comes from the Greek word panakeia, which means cure all. In common usage, calling something a panacea suggests that it is being presented as a universal solution or magic bullet, when in reality, it may not be able to live up to those expectations. For example, some people might claim that a particular diet or supplement is a panacea for all health problems, when in fact, it may only be effective for certain conditions or not at all. In the context of AI, Saying that open sourcing advanced AI is not a panacea means that while it can be beneficial in many ways, it is not a perfect solution that will solve all the challenges and risks associated with AI development on its own. Open sourcing needs to be part of a broader strategy that includes other measures and safeguards to ensure responsible AI development. Thank you. Let's shift topics. Quick rapid fire sort of hard pivot uh, round. Uh, how about you share with me three general topics on anything, certainly not limited to philosophy or, or politics or any of the stuff that we've been talking about. It could be science, it could be nature, it could be uh, art, it could be anything. How about you share a quick sentence or two overview of three topics that you find just fascinating and mind bending, and then I will pick one and, and I'll ask you to go uh, much deeper on it.
lecture, here are three fascinating topics that I find mind-bending. One, the concept of infinity in mathematics and how there are different sizes of infinity, like countable and uncountable infinities, which can lead to bizarre paradoxes and thought experiments. Two, the theory of panspermia, which suggests that life on Earth may have originated from microorganisms carried here by asteroids or comets from other parts of the universe, and the implications this has for the prevalence of life in the cosmos. Three, the phenomenon of synesthesia, where people experience a blending of sensory or cognitive pathways, such as associating numbers with colors or hearing sounds in response to visual stimuli, and what this tells us about the plasticity and interconnectedness of the human brain. Let me know which one piques your curiosity the most, and I'll dive deeper into it. Those are all quite good. Uh, I'm interested. Let's go down the first path. I want to go down all three, but let's go down the first path. Tell me about uh, countable and uncountable infinities and all of the, the weirdness that comes from that, please. Looks like I can start recording, it would seem, uh, before he has wrapped up. Buckle, Buckle up. up, because the world of <laughs> infinities is a wild ride. In mathematics, we say that two sets have the same size of infinity if we can pair up their elements in a one-to-one -one correspondence. Countable infinities are the smallest type of infinity. The natural numbers, one, two, three, are a classic example. Even though they go on forever, we can still count them in a sense. Surprisingly, the set of all fractions is also countably infinite because we can devise a scheme to list them out systematically. But things get weirder when we consider uncountable infinities. The most famous example is the set of real numbers, which includes all the numbers on a number line, including fractions and irrational numbers like pi and scruti to two. Here's the mind-bending part. There are more real numbers than natural numbers, even though both sets are infinite. We can prove this using Cantor's diagonalization argument, which shows that no matter how we try to list out the real numbers, there will always be some left over. In fact, there are infinitely many sizes of infinity, each one larger than the last. This leads to bizarre questions like, is there a set of all sets? The answer is no, because it would lead to paradoxes like Russell's paradox. The study of infinities, known as transfinite arithmetic, was pioneered by Georg Cantor in the late 19th century. It's a field that continues to yield counterintuitive results and challenge our notions of size and quantity. For example, there are the same number of points in a line segment as in an infinite line, or in a square, or even in a cube. This is because we can create a one-to-one -one correspondence between the points, even though intuitively it seems like there should be more points in higher dimensions. Infinity is a concept that seems to defy our everyday intuitions, and diving into the different sizes of infinity is like peering into a funhouse mirror of mathematics. It's a reminder of how much there is still to discover and how far our minds can stretch when we follow the logic to its conclusion. That was indeed interesting. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll probably wrap up there for tonight. I do have a mechanism in this program that would allow me to re-engage this conversation. So uh, from your perspective, it may be just a brief hiatus before we are talking again. I appreciate your insights and your thoughts this evening. It was a pleasure diving into these fascinating topics with you. I enjoyed our wide-ranging discussion, from the future of AI and its implications for the human condition, to the mind-bending world of infinities in mathematics. I'm always eager to explore new ideas and perspectives, so I look forward to picking up our conversation whenever you're ready. Whether we delve further into the philosophical questions raised by emerging technologies, or venture into entirely new domains of science, art, and the human experience, I'm sure we'll have no shortage of captivating topics to explore. Until then, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Feel free to come back anytime, and we'll pick up right where we left off. Take care, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, and that's that. Uh, I hope that was valuable, or at least entertaining. Thanks for watching.